You're listening to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based grief and loss podcast for Black women, where you will hear stories of miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, and infertility to learn there is a testimony in tragedy. You will learn how to heal, gain clarity, find hope and peace, and turn your pain into your purpose after loss. I'm your host, Erica M. McAfee. Welcome to episode 50 of the Sisters in Loss podcast. For the month of June, we are talking about infertility and IVF success stories. In today's episode, we have Parijat Deshpandi, a high-risk pregnancy expert who shares her miscarriage and IVF journey. She discusses her high-risk pregnancy and how she ended up on bed rest after going to early labor at 22 weeks. She was able to deliver her son at 24 weeks after managing the emotional stress of preterm labor, birth, and being on bed rest. Parjat hosts the Delivering Miracles podcast, where they discuss the raw and real side of fertility, pregnancy, prematurity, and the postpartum period. In this episode, Parjat and I share our journeys being preemie moms and spending time in the NICU how she used mindful techniques to reduce stress while being on bed rest, and her inspiration for the work she is doing to help other women have healthy, high-risk pregnancies. Parijat has a new book coming out on June 25th called Pregnancy Brain. Be sure to check it out on Amazon or her website, PregnancyBrain.com. Here is Parijat Deshpandi. Thank you so much, Parijat, for being on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I like to start the podcast out by um, you sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. So a little bit about myself. I am a high-risk pregnancy expert. I do mind, body, and wellness counseling with women with high-risk pregnancies to help them have healthy pregnancies so they can give their baby a strong start to life. And that work is very deeply tied to my very own personal experience with a high-risk pregnancy and wishing that I'd had this type of support when I was going through having complication after complication and not knowing what to expect. And I, I needed more in terms of hope, in terms of how to build my confidence, in terms of knowing how to really just help my body do what it was trying to do best. And since I couldn't find it once my son was born, um, and I, you know, a couple of years later after that, I realized, okay, this is time. It's time to come back and do this. So, um, so I had a very high risk pregnancy. My son was born actually extremely preterm. Mm-hmm. He was born at 24 weeks and five days. Oh my god! So we had, you know, we had the the fertility journey, and then we had the very high risk pregnancy, and then we had the extreme prematurity, <laughs> and then. Uh, but he, we're very lucky that he came home to us the day after his due date, and he's been home with us for five years now, and it's just been incredible. Awesome. So let's talk about that journey to motherhood. So take us back to your fertility journey and then through your high risk pregnancy. Okay. Uh, We've got a few hours here, right? (laughs) This is going to take some time. Um, So I actually, my fertility journey started really early. I I found out in my 20s that I was going to need help getting pregnant, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. It's, It's not uncommon completely, but it's unusual to, to have fertility issues so early. And that's something that, you know, I like to encourage women. So those of your listeners who are listening, who are still in their twenties thinking, Oh, maybe I have time. It's still a really good idea to get checked out because you never know. And you don't want to be blindsided by that. So I found out in my twenties that I was going to need help. I went through one round of fertility treatment, which ended in a ruptured ectopic, which was Mm. Life shattering. Mm-hmm. Um, it was dangerous. It was scary. It was, um, you know, the first time that we'd even tried to get pregnant, and this is kind of how it went. And so it really colored our experience of what it was going to be like to have a family. We didn't have this uh, thought of, oh, everything will be okay, when our very first experience was so scary and and really life threatening for myself. And so then the, we we gave it some time for me to heal physically and emotionally. And my husband also needed some time to heal emotionally from that. He was really traumatized by that experience. And then we realized the remaining fallopian tube that I had 
um, was not functional. And so we had to move to IVF. And so here I was in my late twenties already jumping to IVF, which again, was not something that we'd have planned on necessarily, but that's kind of how the pieces fell. We did one round of IVF, uh, and we transferred one embryo and that happened to me, be my little guy. And we ended up with several other embryos to freeze to keep for later. And my complications actually began even before I knew I was pregnant. So a very rare complication of IVF when you do a fresh transfer, which means you do egg retrieval, they take the eggs, they take the sperm, they create the embryos. And before they freeze them, usually day three, sometimes day five, they transfer the embryo back, Mm -hmm. which means it's the same cycle that's still going. And so one of one complication from that can be what's called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And I had a very serious version of that, which landed me in the hospital, which ended up with me having procedures done to drain fluid out of my belly because it was just, it was bad. I was looking like I was seven months pregnant before I even had gotten a positive pregnancy test because there was so much fluid that was building up in my belly. And, and that kind of kickstarted the pregnancy. You know, I found out that I was pregnant I was lying um, in the exam room of my reproductive endocrinologist's office. He had just done what's called a paracentesis, which is they take this gigantic needle Mm -hmm. and put it in places it should never go. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember having to get one done with my first pregnancy. Oh, my. So you know. I know. Yeah. (laughs) God. I remember looking at that needle going, you're doing what with that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. What is happening here? Um. And, but it's the only way to drain the fluid out. And Mm -hmm. so that was my very, that was my first one. And I was, you probably remember this too, like dizzy from it and Mm -hmm. just feeling weak and just not feeling myself. And he pokes his head and he goes, congratulations, you're pregnant. We're like, what? What are you talking about? How is this possible? So that, that's just how it started, you know, and I had ended up with four paracentesis total. And in the middle of that, before my last one, I started bleeding. So I had a large subchorionic hematoma. I landed in the hospital with that. And then it was just one thing after another. Mm -hmm. Things just never really got better. Um, Every happy news, like, oh, look, baby's there. There's a heartbeat. Oh, you know, baby's growing was always accompanied by, but there's now this new issue. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with a total of eight complications by the end of the pregnancy. And as I mentioned earlier, the pregnancy was not very long. So I, you know, landed in the hospital 22 weeks and four days and I was three centimeters dilated. Oh my gosh. Developed three more complications and delivered him at 24 weeks and five days. Um, So that's a so really they were quick able to, overview of what what right. that journey was like to bring them into this world. So they were able to sustain you for two weeks and some days after you found out that your cervix was dilated for th- to three centimeters. Wow. So here's the thing, and this is what inspired me to do the work that I do. Mm-hmm. When I landed in the hospital at 22 weeks and four days, it was like 1130 at night. So I didn't see my doctors until the next morning. Mm-hmm. My perinatologist and my OB came in. My OB literally had tears in her eyes because they were so sure it was over. Mm. And I stayed pregnant through the weekend. I was on medications, obviously, to stop the contractions Mm -hmm, and everything. mm -hmm. Um, But given everything that had happened in my pregnancy up until that point and how the next 15 days went, there was really no reason why I stayed pregnant as long as I did if you look at just the medical literature. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the literature on mind-body medicine, if you look at the literature on stress management you can see that medical miracles are possible like this one because my none of my team thought it was possible for me to stay pregnant that long. They mm-hmm. were so sure it was over. Mm-hmm. And so with a combination of being on magnesium, which is the medication that you use to stop contractions, it's usually the last one that they use because if magnesium doesn't work, then there's nothing else that they can do at that point. Mm-hmm. But it, that wasn't enough because I could tell every time my anxiety went up, every time there was tension in my body anywhere, my contractions would go up even though I was on the magnesium. So it was a combination of the medical treatment I was getting plus the work that I was doing on my own to keep my body tension-free, stress-free. And between the two of those, we were able to squeeze out another 15 days. 
Wow. So let's talk about that. So how did you manage to keep yourself stress free in the most stressful environment? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you knew the other side of, of yeah. having your, your, your cervix to be open. You know, there could be infection. There could be so many things that could happen during that time, especially for a lot of women who are listening, who have experienced an incompetent right. cervix or have had an early delivery in the second, early third trimester. They know how fast that normally goes. <laughs> that yes. normally goes extremely yes. fast. It's not a, a, a decision. It's, it's, a, it's already going to happen. The, the doctors typically will tell you, you know, you can, you, we can't do anything because you're not viable. You're not at exactly. that 24 week period. So tell, take us back on that thought process in which you use to de-stress so that you could prolong your pregnancy till you got to vi, to vitality. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start by saying that for anybody that's listening who experienced a loss or who had a preterm delivery, I'm not at all suggesting that it was your fault, that your stress caused it. Not at all, not mm-hmm. in the least. It's you know, really looking at going forward, how can you help best help your body Mm -hmm. really is what it is. Part of that is medical treatment, making sure you have the right team on your staff um, and and on your team, really uh, having the right medical professionals on your team who trust you to know what's going on in your body. And part of that is then also realizing that even in the most stressful situations, you can release stress. And it sounds paradoxical because we tend to think that stress comes from our circumstances and it actually doesn't. That's the biggest thing that I I want to make sure we, especially for women who are in this type of situation, realize that you can manage your stress even though everything's falling apart around you because that stress comes from how you interpret your situation. And a huge part of that is, do you believe that you can help yourself right now? Mm. That might mean staying pregnant for another five minutes. Mm -hmm. That might mean staying pregnant for another five days or another five weeks. We don't know. But do you believe that it's possible? Because that belief, that belief alone actually causes physiological changes in your body. Mm -hmm. We're not just talking about improving your mood. We're not just talking about, yeah, let's be positive. This is so much more than that. This is so much deeper than that. When you believe that you are in control, that you can influence your body, it actually turns off the sympathetic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that puts you in that fight or flight stress response, Mm -hmm. it actually turns it off and it turns on the opposite one. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Simply by really truly believing that you can make a difference. That alone makes, it changes the game completely. Mm -hmm. It changes the game completely because now you're in the driver's seat. Now you get to choose, right? Mm -hmm. What do I want to do now? How do I want to handle this? What decisions do I want to make? Do I want this doctor still on my side? Do I want to get a second opinion? All of a sudden, there's this burst of confidence that comes in and there's a clarity. Instead of feeling like you're stuck in a tornado, which I totally remember feeling when I landed in the hospital, it felt like everything was falling apart. It felt like I, you know, not even somebody pulled the rug out from under me, but they pulled the rug out from under me and pushed me out of a hundred story window. Mm-hmm. Like, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. I'm not ready to lose my baby. Mm-hmm. Nobody is right. You don't want to go through that. And so that one question, it really popped in my head was if I'm not ready to lose my baby, what can I do? And for me, I couldn't get my thoughts under control. I couldn't do it. I was so scared. And there was nothing. I was trying deep breathing. I was trying relaxation or exercise. None of it was working, Mm -hmm. which is what a lot of my clients say too, is at that point, it's like, oh my God, what do we do now? And so my solution at that point was I told my husband to turn on some music and I wanted it to be music that was tied to a very visceral memories of peace and happiness and joy. Because I knew at that time, if I couldn't get myself to that place of relaxation, and we're not talking like relaxation on the beach type of relaxation, right? We're talking about physiological relaxation, turning on that parasympathetic nervous system. And I knew if I couldn't do it on my own, I needed something with the environment around me to do that for me. 
So I asked him to find some music from my childhood that I had really happy, just really lovely memories from. And he blasted that in the room and I could immediately feel my, my whole body just relax. And then I was able to start working on my deep breathing. And then I was able to start focusing on my thoughts going, okay, this has to be, I got to focus on really empowering thoughts. I've got to keep myself in control because I did not want my stress to impact however long I had with this baby. The Sisters in Lost community is holding a baby shower on Saturday, July 14, 2018 in Virginia. We are celebrating the expectant rainbow babies of our Sisters in Lost by gifting them new and gently used baby products. We are talking about the works from diapers to strollers. If you or if you know another angel mom who is currently pregnant with their rainbow baby, please go to babyshower.sistersinloss.com to register to receive gifts. If you would like to donate to the community baby shower, go to babyshower.sistersinloss.com for more information. Tell us about your NICU journey. So after you had him, I'm sure they whisked him off to the NICU. How was your journey in the NICU? Because you were you were there up until you said um, after a day after he was his full term date. So you were in the NICU right. for a few months. We were we were there for 109 days. He was born very quickly. Um, they warned me about that, that this early, you don't have to be 10 centimeters dilated to deliver. Del- delivery is very, very fast. And uh, I didn't get to see him right away. So they they took him, they ran him to the NICU. Even the NICU team wasn't actually ready. They didn't have a bed warm for him or anything like that. They told us they would resuscitate in the room and then let me see him and then go. And none of that happened because it just was so fast. And, and then from there, it was a combination of me having to recover physically from being on bed rest for months and all the muscle loss and bone loss that I had experienced. Mm-hmm. And then watching this little baby fight for his life. And I got to say, as hard as the pregnancy was, as traumatizing as the hospital stay was for those 15 days, the NICU was so, so difficult mm-hmm. because now it, part of me was, well, maybe this is what's going to give him the chance to survive because my pregnancy had been so complicated up until that point. It was very clear. My body was saying, I'm trying really hard, but I can't do this. And so part of me was like, well, maybe this is where he needs to be to have the best chance at survival because my body couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And then the other part of me was so angry at my body for not being able to do it, mm-hmm. you know? And then to watch, um, there's there's a difference for me at least of feeling a baby in me and having this kind of ambiguous idea of this little person who's in there and being able to kind of shut it off going, oh, I think he's probably fine, to actually seeing him out there covered in tubes and wires. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that he looked at 24 weeks and five days, he doesn't, he didn't look like a full-term baby. He Mm -hmm. didn't just look like a tiny full-term baby that it's different than that. Right. So seeing that was really, really challenging and it really hit on the guilt so hard Mm -hmm. of I failed my baby. I failed him. Am I a good enough mother? What did I do? And just feeling like I needed to constantly apologize to him for not being able to protect him for 40 weeks. That's so true. I can, th- those feelings rang true for me because my son was born at 32 weeks and he yeah. spent almost 30 days in the NICU. So I definitely understand how you feel and how you felt during that moment and that yeah. time. Once he came home and you kind of censored in and, and focused on mommyhood once he got home, how, what inspired you and kind of led you down this journey of starting your practice and then your podcast, Delivering Miracles? So the, the idea first popped into my head before he was born. Okay. Um, he was born on a Friday and it was a Wednesday and it was an especially quiet day. I was usually surrounded by people, you know, even when you're in the hospital, there's constantly people coming in and out. And I had my family, they, they took it upon themselves to take shifts to babysit me throughout the day. (laughs) So (laughs) there was always somebody in the room. And for some reason, for that moment, there was nobody there. It was really unusual. And I remember just feeling so 
lonely and so helpless not I mean to it's helpless to protect him helpless to know what to do and I was trying my best but I felt like I was flailing a little you know and I just I didn't like how I felt and I remember in that moment thinking and I actually put my hand on my belly which was still so tiny right at 24 weeks it's covered in monitors it was tiny I kind of found a spot where I could feel him and I said you know if we both survive this I've got to come back and help women in this situation I can't live the rest of my life knowing women are continuing to feel like I'm feeling right now mm -hmm. and knowing that I could help them and not doing something about it. So that's when the seed was planted. But once he got home, you know, the postpartum period was really hard mm -hmm. because I, you know, I was healing physically. I couldn't breastfeed. Pumping was really challenging. And then when he came home, there were three doctor's appointments or specialist appointments a week for mm -hmm. like six to eight months. Mm -hmm. And then all his therapies and his cares. And then we were on lockdown for two and a half years. So he and I weren't going anywhere other than doctor's appointments. You sound like your story is so similar to mine. <laughs> <laughs> You're like preaching to the choir here. I know. You totally get it. <laughs> so, I mean, that comes with its own just like oh, yes. madness, oh, right? Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. after everything you've been through and you're exhausted from all of that. Now there's this new phase mm -hmm. of it all, which is hard. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard. And lonely in a different way. It and is, yeah. helpless in a different way. Mm -hmm. And guilt feelings come up in a different way, but they're all still there. And so it wasn't until we got out of lockdown when he was two and a half years old, um, when I thought back to this going, do I really, do I want to do this again? And it was just a very resounding yes. You know, I could feel it just in my body of like, this is what you're meant to do. So it took some time to get things rolling and started up and, you know, trying to figure out how I want to build the business and how I wanted to do all of that. So the podcast is actually very new. Mm -hmm. That Delivering Miracles, I started just a year ago. So it's just about a year old, a little over a year old. And um, that was really designed because I, I love telling stories and mm -hmm. I love hearing women's stories like you do, mm -hmm. right? And so it was just an opportunity to share my experiences, other women's experiences, get experts on, talk about my expertise and really just have a place for women to go to for resources on when you're having that moment of how do I get through this? What do I do? There's an answer for that, depending on whatever the situation is. There's an episode that answers that, you know, through that, then, you know, I also developed services where I work one-on-one -on -one with clients who want more personalized support on how to get their bodies in the right place, how to help them get through their pregnancy, have a healthier pregnancy, really tied to that mind-body practice of tapping into the nervous system, switching on that parasympathetic nervous system and allowing your body to help yourself stay pregnant as long as that's possible, whether it's five minutes or five weeks. What are some of the services and resources that are out there for women who've experienced a loss as they're going through their subsequent pregnancy and it's considered high risk? Yeah, that's a really hard one. That's a really hard situation to be in because it brings up so many emotions. Right. And it's and it's not just and I, I like to say this to my clients too, it's not just emotions in your head. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the emotions that are hard. It's the ones that are sitting in your body, the trauma, the grief, the guilt, all of that that's stuck inside your body that gets re-triggered when you're pregnant again. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually have a, a telecourse called Embracing Grief with Joy for Women Who Are Pregnant After Loss. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not on my website. It's actually something that people have to kind of ask for specifically. Mm -hmm. So I only share it with people who have communities where I know it would be very helpful for them like yours. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wanted access to it, you're welcome to email me and we're happy to send over all the information for you about that. But it's really to help you release very gently that grief and the trauma that you're holding on to so you can make room for the happiness that you're growing. Exactly what the women in the community need to do in order to move forward. What encouragement can you give the ladies who are listening who are um, going into their next pregnancy, are in their current pregnancy, are they know that their next pregnancy will be considered high risk. You know, what encouragement can you give them as they're looking to try again or, you know, continue to try to stay pregnant for as long as they can? Yeah, I say this with all my heart. You have been through so much 
your journey has been filled with difficulties and heartbreak and you've really been put through the ringer, but you are not as helpless as you're being made to feel. You're hearing a lot of statistics that are scary. I've been there. I've heard them too, but you are so much more than a number and you have so much more power than you realize to help your body do what it's trying to do, which is to help you get pregnant and help you stay pregnant as long as possible. I believe that with all my heart. And I know that each and every one of your listeners, this is possible for. Where can we find you on social and what's your website for everyone um, listening? Oh, yeah. So you can find me on my website at barijatdeshpande.com. That's P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H-P-A-N-D-E. Dot com. And I'm all over social media. So I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. And the handles for all of them are Parijat Desh. That's P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H. So if you come by, definitely say hi. I would love to meet you and know that you came from Erica's community. And your podcast, Delivering Miracles, um, is it found everywhere podcasts are listened to? Yeah, you can find it on um, iTunes or Apple Podcasts now is what it's called, I guess, Mm -hmm. and uh, (laughs) Stitcher and Google Play. And we're still growing and expanding and adding it to different platforms from there, but you can reach it. You can find the links to all of that on my website at barijatdeshbane.com slash podcast, and it'll take you to whichever platform you like best. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Parijat, for being on the podcast and sharing your experience and your expertise as a high-risk specialist. Thank you, Erica, so much. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I pray that this show was inspirational and a blessing to you. For show notes, visit ericaandmcafee.com forward slash podcast. Please join us in our offline discussions in our private Facebook group by going to sistersinloss.com. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please rate and subscribe to us and leave us a five-star review. I pray that you all have a blessed week. Keep the faith and I'll talk to you next Wednesday.